Good afternoon, class. Welcome to yet another virtual lecture, History 1700. Uh, if all goes well, I will be joining you shortly, but I am fighting the law today. Alright, let's hop back into the wonderful world of the 1930s. When we ended off last time, we were discussing some of the initiatives that Adolf Hitler was taking to try and befriend the British, in particular, how he kept testing the international community to see if anyone would stand up to his policies concerning the persecution of Jews. And as we recognize after the Evian Conference, nobody was ready to try and stop Hitler when it came to Jewish policy. Perhaps the greatest test that Hitler is going to have is just after the closing of the Evian Conference Adolf Hitler pushes forward with his larger rhetoric about trying to reunite all Germanic peoples under one government. In September of 1938, Adolf Hitler is going to demand that the western territory of Czechoslovakia, known as the Sudetenland, be given over to Germany since the majority of people who live there ethnically are German. The problem with the Sudetenland proposals is that Hitler is not actually interested in reuniting German people. What he's interested in is there is a factory there in the Sudetenland called the Skoda Works that produces two major pieces of weaponry for war. One is called C4, which is plastic explosives. The other one being the Panzer tank, which is the fastest tank in the entire world. Skoda Works had been selling these tanks to Adolf Hitler up until January of 1938, but cut off his credit when Hitler did not have enough money to actually purchase any more Panzer tanks. The main reason why Hitler wants this area called the Sudetenland is so he can control the international supply of plastic explosives and to be able to get those Panzer tanks for free. The Sudetenland crisis is also a test of the international community to see if this alliance between France, Czechoslovakia, and the Soviet Union will stand if these nations are tested. At the time, France made no offers to Czechoslovakia in terms of assistance. Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, on the other hand, ordered a full mobilization of the Russian Red Army and contacted the Polish government, requesting permission to march troops through southern Poland to go into Czechoslovakia to protect this nation as a shield against Adolf Hitler. The problem was, when Stalin contacted the Polish government, the Polish government refused to allow Soviet troops to march through. And what Stalin announced to the world was that he was a man of his word, that he would not betray Czechoslovakia, and that Soviet troops would march through Poland regardless if Czechoslovakia was threatened. The solution that Great Britain is going to design at the time is broadly known as a policy of appeasement. September 29th, 1938, representatives of Great Britain, France, Italy and Germany are going to get together in the German city of Munich for what's oftentimes referred to as the Munich Conference. At the Munich Conference, these four major powers are going to decide the future fate of the Sudetenland and the nation of Czechoslovakia. Ironically and tragically enough, neither the Soviets or the Czechs are invited to the conference to participate. Adolf Hitler puts out a proposal stating that if he is given the Sudetenland, that he will not ask for anything more, and that World War II can be averted. Not only does Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain of Great Britain uh, agree that this is a very good and perhaps sound idea, but he also takes things a step further and asks Adolf Hitler about the friendship pact that had been proposed by Hermann Göring and Lord Halifax. This was exactly the moment that Adolf Hitler was waiting for, 
and he had a copy of the document with him and invited Neville Chamberlain to sign. When Neville Chamberlain returned to London, he returned to cheering crowds and gave one of the most famous speeches of his career entitled The Peace in Our Time Speech, where he held up a copy of the British Nazi Friendship Pact and said that he had just prevented World War II from happening and had saved the peace of his time. Since the Germans now had a secure ally in Great Britain, the Nazis are going to send military forces into the Sudetenland on October 10th. At this point then, Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler had control of Skoda Works, which meant he now had a virtual monopoly on the top tank technology in the entire world. Joseph Stalin now believed that not only could the West not be trusted because they were pushing Hitler's armies to the east towards the Soviet Union, but he also perceived that Neville Chamberlain was not some type of dupe of Adolf Hitler, but was now an open ally and supporter of Nazi Germany. The only British pol politician who spoke out openly about this at the time was once again Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill gave a speech to the Houses of Parliament stating that Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain had not just prevented World War II, he had just given Hitler everything that Hitler needed for World War II, and that if Churchill were made Prime Minister, he would immediately tear up that friendship pact with the Third Reich, sign an alliance with the Soviet Union, and that World War II could still be prevented but that the clock was now ticking. Since the international community had not stood up to Hitler when it came down to the Sudetenland crisis, Hitler decides to take things a step further with the open persecution of Jews to see how the international community would react. What's going to trigger an event called Kristallnacht, uh, which broadly translates to the Night of the Broken Glass, is a young Polish Jew by the name of Herschel Greenspan doing something very stupid. About three months prior to this event, approximately 16,000 Jews in Germany who were of Polish descent were rounded up told that they could no longer live in Germany and were taken to the Polish border. The problem for those Jewish refugees was that the Polish government was just as much, if not more, anti-Semitic as the German government under the Nazi regime. The Polish government refused to allow these refugees to enter Poland and Germany refused to allow them to come back which means these 16,000 people were now abandoned and neither side would allow the International Red Cross to come in to assist these refugees who were stranded. On the morning of November 7th, Herschel Greenspan got a postcard from his little sister, now realizing that his family was amongst those 16,000 Jews who were trapped on the German and Polish border. Jan Herschel was only 17 years old and living in Paris with his uncle as a student attending university. The postcard he received from his sister essentially stated that their family had run out of money, had run out of food, and that she was quite sure that they were all going to die. Herschel realized that there was nothing he could do to save his family. What he also recognized was that he had just enough money left in his savings account to afford to buy a pistol. So on the morning of November 7th, young Herschel, frustrated with the news he had just received that his family was about to die, went to a store, he bought a pistol, and marched into the German embassy and gunned down Ernst von Rath, 
who was a German diplomat at the time, living in Paris. When von Rath died of his bullet wounds on November 9th, Adolf Hitler and the top leaders of Nazi Germany got on the radio airwaves and called for the German people to take part in a public act of retribution, to take revenge against the Jews. He used the murder of this diplomat as a pretext to say that Herschel Greenspan was solid evidence of an international Jewish conspiracy. Now the problem is Herschel wasn't part of any conspiracy. He was just a young frustrated man who learned of the untimely death of his family at the hands of the Nazi regime and who did something very stupid. What's going to occur on the evening of November 9th is almost every single synagogue in the entire nation of Germany is going to be burnt to the ground. Every Jewish business that existed at the time is going to be attacked with front shop windows being smashed out, stores being looted, and essentially destroyed. While Hitler's pretext on this was once again saying that he was taking revenge against the Jews, the reality is, once again, the Jews are Hitler's backup finance plan. What Adolf Hitler is going to do is to tell those Jewish business owners that they need to rebuild their shops. But that since they were responsible for these tax upon the Jewish community, the insurance companies could not pay out money to those Jewish business owners. But instead, that insurance money needed to be paid as a reparations fine to the German government. Once again, this is one way of coming up with a large amount of money quickly. Number two, in terms of rebuilding these shops, not only does Hitler force these Jews to rebuild their shops that the Nazis themselves had destroyed, but once the shops are rebuilt, those Jews had been forced to utilize Nazi-funded contractors. And once those shops are finished being reconstructed, Adolf Hitler seizes all of them and auctions them off to German business owners. Which means Hitler made money off from the insurance. He made money off from the reconstruction. And once the reconstruction was done, he made money on auctioning off those businesses. Once again, this is Hitler's finance plan to pay off his creditors who have built up his military. As far as Jewish civilians in Germany go, that evening almost every single Jewish home in Germany is going to be attacked. Nazi stormtroopers and German civilians breaking into Jewish homes beating people up in the streets, gang raping mothers in front of cheering crowds, and essentially torturing the Jewish community. In the next couple of days, every single Jewish male from ages 6 to the age of 60 is arrested and sent to Dachau concentration camp. At this time, if you were a prisoner in Dachau, you are not forced to stay there. What can occur is your family can pay a fine to the German government and they'll release you from Dachau, saving your life. Once again, a creative way for Hitler to come up with money. Perhaps the greatest tragedy with Kristallnacht is that international reporters from throughout the world were there in Germany at this time. And when they wrote reports about the events of Kristallnacht and sent them home to their editors, editors refused to publish the stories, fearing that since World War II had almost broken out one month prior to this, that if one exposed Hitler and his crimes and potentially antagonized him, that this could lead to the outbreak of World War II. This is exactly what Hitler was hoping for. Since Hitler